Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to talk about the coronavirus pandemic through the lens of photographing and cinematic history, no pun intended. Though, no, I'm not going to opine on which is the best pandemic movie of all time. You guys can do that in the comments section down below. Have at it. Really, I want to take this opportunity to repurpose a refrain I often use here on the channel. So often I say, yes, it's about the gear. I mean, I'm usually talking about cameras or lenses, but in this case, face masks, test kits, ventilators, respirators, hospital beds, and the like. And then I say, but no, it's not about the gear. It's about the people. In this instance, I mean, I usually talk about photographers or image makers. I mean, not only medical professionals, but us, all of us. Also, as I so often do, I'll just cut to the chase because the coronavirus pandemic is bad, really bad, but we have seen worse. We will get through it. And what we can do, what you and I need to do is keep calm and carry on. Stick with me to the end where I make some specific recommendations to help you with that. Not business as usual carry on because that will just make things horribly worse, but with the kind of courage, perseverance, introspection, humor, humanity, common cause, cheer, goodwill, and love that show us at our best. Again, all of us, irrespective of race, religion, gender, or gender identity, nationality, political affiliation, or any of a hundred other labels that in times like this make it clear that those labels are less relevant than ever. Because in the end, a pandemic like this is proof positive that we are all in this together. You know, united we stand, divided we fall kind of stuff, which some of us may recognize as something British Prime Minister Winston Churchill said in 1941, which makes the whole keep calm and carry on that much cooler. And which, by the way, while some of us in the U.S. might assume was first uttered by, say, President Abraham Lincoln during the American Civil War, can in fact be attributed to another U.S. politician, John Dickinson, a century earlier eight years before the American Revolutionary War. Though, you can find the same premise in a number of phrases in the New Testament, in turn preceded by, and to the extent recorded history allows us to trace it, Aesop, more than half a millennium earlier than that, in his fable of the four oxen and the lion. And again, for others of us, it might be a reference you recognize from something a little more recent, a song, a lyric, say, by... Taylor Swift, as it turns out, Pink Floyd, Tupac, Agnostic Front, Stradivarius, Glittertons, Asian Dub Foundation. Or a snippet of dialogue from Captain America, Civil War, Harry Potter, and the Goblet of Fire, Transformers. You get the idea. So, let's get into some details. First, as I implied earlier, it's critically important we all acknowledge, and more of us do every day, that this is bad. How bad? Well, first, there is the math. And then there are the projections. And the comparison. Then there are the extraordinary measures for extraordinary times. Apart from all that, there is the very personal reality faced by each and every one of us, ranging from minor inconvenience, there goes brunch at Name Your Trendy Eatery in Name Your Trendy Neighborhood, to death of a loved one, overrun health care systems, potentially ravaged refugee camps, existential economic threat, and everything in between. You guys know what's happening. In the imaging industry, factories have been shut down and offices closed in an attempt to ride out the virus and flatten the curve. New camera introductions have been delayed. Photokina, NAB, canceled. Retailers, temporarily closed. Photography gigs of every sort, from fashion to weddings and more, have dried up as the events themselves have been canceled or postponed. In the movie business, 
while film production has been idled. Projects have been canceled or pushed back to 2021 or later. Movie theaters already on shaky ground are closed. The ripple effect in our corner of the world has been enormous. So many of us, from retail staff at camera stores to Hollywood gaffers, grips, makeup artists, stylists, and again, everyone in between. I mean, you've watched the rolling credits at the end of modern films. You know how many people are involved in a single movie face, right, existential economic crisis. Now, I'm going to get personal with you for a few minutes here. Not because I feel a compelling need to unload, but because I want you to know you're not alone. This is personal for all of us. And I'm not just offering advice, I'm taking my own advice because frankly, I needed something to help me put this all into perspective. And now that I have, I want to share it with you. So Claudia and I consider ourselves fortunate, but like everyone else, we have our own worries. Maybe you can relate. My at-risk 87-year-old mother, the person who introduced me to photography, she's essentially a shut-in in in Queens, New York, who none of us can visit for fear of inadvertently bringing coronavirus into her home. Claudia's parents in Switzerland. Her dad turned 80 last year. Both he and her mom are in the highest-risk age group. And the coronavirus infection rate is climbing steeply there now, too. My sister and her 61-year-old husband, he's in self-quarantine at their home in New Jersey, conducting business via computer and over the phone, while still running a fever and awaiting the results of the coronavirus test he took last week. My immunocompromised, cancer-surviving other sister on Long Island. One of her sons, one of my nephews, working in the emergency department of a major New York City medical center. And then... There are my girls. My older daughter out in Seattle. She's a reporter at the Seattle Times on the front lines, part of the team covering the pandemic at the epicenter of its outbreak here in the U.S. My younger daughter in Brooklyn. She's a freelance illustrator who has the technical savvy and the emotional predisposition to work remotely. But given the sudden economic downturn, she's spending more time online with her Dungeons & Dragons group most of whom, interestingly enough, are based in Hawaii. And Claudia's son in Colorado. Now, he's young, strong, and as far as we know, really healthy. He's been trail running in the mountains out there for more than a year. But he knows he could inadvertently pass the virus to someone older or with pre-existing conditions, so he has to be just as careful as anyone else. Then, of course, there's Claudia. My wife, my partner, and my love, though, actually, we worry about each other. Not that much, because we're both reasonably healthy, scrupulous about following all of the recommendations by the CDC, aware that worrying is itself counterproductive. But still, we are part of the higher-risk, older people category, though, 63 is the new 43... You know what? Normally, I think that's kind of funny. But it isn't really. Not at the moment. Especially because you don't even have to be older to wind up in intensive care. The probabilities get worse as the age rises or comorbidities increase. But as the New York Times just reported, there are plenty of 20 to 50-year-olds in ICUs around the world. And that's no place anyone wants to be. Anyway. Yeah. We've also taken a financial and emotional hit as a result of our decision to postpone our March 2020 Streets of New York workshop because our workshops are highlights of our years in both ways. Of course, it's not just about us. We have attendees coming in from four different continents who have now had to change their travel plans and face their own challenges even now. And that's the larger point. With all of this said, ours is just One connected story, there are 8 billion of us on this infinitesimally small planet. Every single one of us has a story. And many are immeasurably worse than ours, or maybe yours, even before this pandemic began. Made spectacularly more disastrous because of it. So yeah, it's bad. 
and the worst of the COVID-19 outbreak remains ahead of us. You know, guys, if you want to share your stories, I, I encourage you to share your stories. So please do so in the comments section below because you are an amazing audience. And sometimes just verbalizing things can be an enormous relief. And who knows, your story may be comforting to someone else. That's a great thing. That's a gift. Still, second, it's important to put this into a broader perspective. As I said at the beginning, as a species, we have been through worse and we will get through this. Now, as I also said, I see history through the lens of photography and the movies too. I love the movies. Those of you who know me know this. Extraordinary images from extraordinary photographers like Dorothea Lange, Margaret Bourke White, Robert Capra and Gerda Taro, Henri Cartier-Bresson, David Douglas Duncan, Nick Utt, and so many more mix interchangeably with no less extraordinary imagery from unknown photographers to give us a perspective that was impossible less than 200 years ago. 20 million people, for example, died in World War I, and we managed to do that all by ourselves, no pandemic necessary. The 1918 flu pandemic, which immediately followed it, however, did kill another 50 million people in an era absolutely primitive in terms of technology, science, communications, and manufacturing compared to where we are today. Germany's post-war hyperinflation was such that, thank you Wikipedia, a loaf of bread in Berlin that cost around 160 marks at the end of 1922 cost this is really the right number, 200 billion marks by late 1923. At least it's the right number as I read it. The stock market crash of 1929 brought on the Great Depression that engulfed the entire world. But it also ushered in the U.S. federal government's Farm Security Administration and its effort under the legendary Roy Stryker to employ photography to generate compassion for rather than vilify and deprive those of us in greatest need. And the need was enormous. The unemployment rate in the U.S. peaked 25% in 1933. The Dust Bowl of 33, 34, 36, and 39, extraordinary drought and erosion, especially in Texas and Oklahoma, affected 100 million acres, caused mass exoduses as farming families had to look elsewhere for work, and generated daily losses, daily, daily, equivalent in today's dollars to 460 million. I repeat, $460 million every day. In Germany, unemployment was even worse. Almost one-third of its working population didn't work. The global economic collapse was a primary factor in the lead-up to the Second World War in which 75 million people died. We did that to ourselves, too. Never mind the 10 to 20 million who died through persecution or starvation under Joseph Stalin or the 30-plus million who died of starvation under Mao Zedong. Never mind the 2.5 to 6 million more who were either beaten or tortured to death or committed suicide, which though not remotely the same thing, does not give a pass to the U.S. for the Japanese-American internment camps set up inside the U.S. in that same period. Nor lessen the scale of the carnage and grief of a single morning at 8.15 a.m. local time on August 6, 1945, and another morning three days later at 11.02 a.m. The coronavirus pandemic is not any of that and is not projected to be that, but we have to do our part because if we don't, who knows where it could lead. But not all is gloom and doom. The pandemic also gives us the opportunity to rise to the occasion. It gives us time. Time for us to reflect, time to reclaim ourselves and our humanity. There is always time for laughter, love, and hope in ways large and small. Time for art. It is not 1918 or 1933, as a friend reminds me, or 1945 or 2008. Well, it doesn't have to be. We do have history to help us navigate our feelings and sort through our options. We do have massive computing power to simulate not only the pandemic spread and therefore what to do about it in the short term, but to design treatments and expedite the manufacture of them. We have the internet with independent media outlets, telemedicine, video chats, smartphones, government labs, public-private partnerships, and the possibility, at least in the United States, of invoking the arcane 1950 Defense Production Act to direct private company priorities, like the manufacturers of those same face masks, ventilators, respirators, all of which are in critically short supply. As a species, 
we have learned some critical lessons, even if too many of us have forgotten them or taken the time to study them in the first place. For right now, at the level of individual responsibility during the coronavirus pandemic, you know the drill. Even if you show no symptoms, and irrespective of your age, social distancing, minimum six feet apart. Don't shake hands. Stay home. That's real social distancing, and governments around the world are mandating that anyway. In any case, wash your hands with soap and water for a minimum of 20 seconds because the soap actually breaks down the virus. Don't touch your face. If you haven't washed your hands immediately beforehand with soap and water or used at least 60% alcohol hand sanitizer because the coronavirus enters through your nose, mouth, or eyes as droplets. The virus can survive on inanimate surfaces for up to three days, so be careful when you take in packages. The lessons right now? Well, last night, commentators yeah, they started talking about unemployment levels that could approach those of the Great Depression. Steve Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, talked about 20%. At a macro level, suddenly the flaws of our traditional economic system, you know, the one that gave us not only the Great Depression of the 1930s, but the Great Recession of 2008 and the free fall we're experiencing now, never mind the au courant gig in online economies, become clearer to more of us every day. Though I do want to point out, that online grocer Peapod, for example, can't deliver new orders in my mother's neighborhood until March 30th, almost two weeks from today as I record this. But in many parts of the world, who cares? There is no access to the internet, no access to computers, no infrastructure to procure or deliver critical supplies in a timely fashion. I'm talking about water. Yesterday, the U.S. stock market plunged again, set off an automatic trading halt again, and brought the Dow back down to where it was the day our current president was inaugurated. Speaking of which, this pandemic is exposing flaws that were there for all to see in our current political and healthcare systems as well. Suddenly, Andrew Yang's UBI doesn't seem so far-fetched, does it? Bernie Sanders, Medicare for all? Not only seems hardly radical, but a really good idea right about now. Waiting on long lines for hours outside of polling stations to vote when we're warned to stay home seems primitive and a prescription for disaster. The idea that all we need to do is return to normal, positively ludicrous. So, if our enforced slowdown around the world changes the shape of the pandemic's spread, and the vast majority of us live to fight another day, which we will. The questions become, live another day to do what precisely? For what precisely? How precisely? Put differently, really, how important are animojis? How important is TikTok? That new lens I've been eyeing. Stupid, stupid commercials. Or, again, Political labels that are actually nothing more than a shorthand for intellectual laziness. How can we, each of us, be better? But hey, who am I to ask? I'm just a YouTuber. Let's breathe. I want to leave you, as I said at the beginning, with a few concrete suggestions to keep calm and carry on. Embrace the slower pace. Turn off the screens. And one, try this. Clean house. I did. It felt great. Of course, I'm not nearly done. And it gets you moving. Two, cook. But if your <laughs> culinary skills are like mine, maybe a supporting role in the kitchen. You know, like cutting up vegetables is a better idea. Though there is a curious satisfaction in actually preparing food, putting it into the oven, and taking it out later to see something transformed that also happens to smell good. Kind of like the old days, printing in an actual darkroom and seeing that image rise from the tray. Yeah, although everything except for the smelling good part. Listen to music or make music because your eyes will start to bug out of your head if you spend too much time Binge watching on Netflix or Hulu, I know. Make photographs, I don't need to tell you that. But if you look more closely inside the world of your own home, you'll see more is there. 
Speaking of which, stay tuned. In our next video, I'm going to announce and give you the details for our second ever photo competition with some truly outstanding prizes sponsored by our friends at Adorama. Guys, you're terrific. In the meantime, the best recommendation I can give photographers right now is read. I'd recommend you start with Henri Cartier-Bresson's The Decisive Moment. And when I say read, I don't mean look at the photographs, though. Of course, please do. I mean read what he wrote in the book's opening pages. If you've already done that, but haven't done it in a while, I suggest you reread it. Or maybe start instead with a photographer whose three boys in Liberia actually inspired. It was the only photographer, the only photograph that ever inspired Cartier Roussel, Martin Munkashi. I'd start with this book. When you're done with either or both of them, I suggest Henri Cartier-Bresson, The Modern Century by Peter Galassi and Cartier-Bresson. This time, read Galassi's words so that you better understand Cartier-Bresson, the human being, the guy behind many of the most iconic images of the 20th century. Finally, I've got a lot more books than this. Revisit Robert Frank's The Americans. Read the foreword written by none other than Jack Kerouac, and then, only then, page through the photographs. 85 of them called from 28,000 by a Swiss emigre. I promise you, if you take the time, it will be worth it. Because now, as I wrap this up, I want to say that for me, the best photography has always been actually about the photographer. The best photography and the best movies have always been about politics, war, economics, illness, the human condition. Lecture over. That's it for today. I, I hope this was okay for you. I hope it was helpful. That was my intent anyway. Haha, -ha. for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. I will see you very soon.